conducted by the College of Sciences and Humanities here at Iowa State. We feel very fortunate this morning having as our moderator Professor Roderick Nash, Professor of History and Chairman of the Environmental Studies Program at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Professor Nash will serve as our moderator and introduce the individual speakers and their topics during the day's program. Professor Nash is famous as an ecologist, environmentalist, and historian of American thought. Without further ado then, let me present Professor Roderick Nash. Thank you, Bob. It's nice to be here and I want to particularly thank you people who came out early for this. I think we'll uh, pick up some people as the day goes on and I think that the organizers of the conference uh, who had the papers uh, distributed as they are, printed form, done a signal service because uh, the impact of the papers can be extended through taking them away, reading them, and ultimately uh, in their publication. I'd like to just set the stage a little bit this morning, and since we're going to be here today dealing with the relationship of man and earth, man and environment in its various forms, I'd like to come right to grips with an important question that's in the back of my mind, and that is, can we afford the humanities? Can we afford a humanistic approach? Critics would say they're weightier problems that impinge on man's survival. That uh, shouldn't we really be talking about making food rather than about the aesthetics and ethics of rural life? And other critics might say, isn't talk about aesthetics and ethics and the rural environment kind of a luxury anyway? Uh, don't we have more serious problems like uh, pollution of air and water, overpopulation, pollution of food chains, nuclear fallout? Isn't uh, arranging, uh, isn't uh, discussing ethics and aesthetics a little like arranging the deck chairs in the Titanic? that uh, it's, it's kind of pointless. Or painting a house that's right in the path of an Iowa tornado. If we're going to be ripped up anyway by this tornado, why should we kind of worry and quibble here about rural life? Well, I wouldn't be here today, obviously, if I didn't think that we can and must afford the humanities in approaching the question of man and the rural environment. And to go back to that metaphor of the tornado bearing down on an Iowa house, I think the tornado inv of environmental destruction is not an act of God or nature, but rather a product of man. That man is the tornado, and more specifically, that man's uh, values and attitudes, man's ideas and feelings are the tornado. I think we could stop right here and say that uh, in many ways we all recognize that ideas are more important than reality, that to be is to be perceived, and that uh, any phase or level of human knowledge or reaction is a question of ideas. Now frequently as I go around in the country talking, I'm asked about what is the worst pollution problem. People come up to you in the airport and just say, Dr. Nash, tell me, what is the worst pollution problem we face? They want about 30 seconds on nuclear fallout or something like that. And I always sort of stagger them by saying, I think it's mind pollution. Mind pollution, up here. And what I have in mind is the short-sighted and ultimately suicidal egocentricity that is bound up with dominating the Earth and conquering it. And when you pause for a moment, this is a back way of getting to a defense of the humanities, of course. When you pause for a moment, consider a bulldozer ripping down a slope. Certainly it isn't the machine that's to blame for what's happening, although there would be some who would put the finger of blame on technology. Of course, it's the driver of the machine who is to blame. But a little deeper look at the question, 
suggests that the man wouldn't be driving it unless he was employed or in some way felt it was right and gainfully proper of him to do this. So you have to look at his employer and ultimately you have to look at the consumer of his product or the society that says this is a good thing to do. And that brings you to the question of values. What a society values, what a society approves. Thinking about Aldo Leopold as I flew in here, of course he's just up the pike in Madison, Wisconsin where uh, Leopold wrote and lived some 25 years ago. Uh, I was thinking that uh, the rape of people isn't tolerated because of ethics. But the rape of the land hasn't yet been accorded an ethical identity or even made an ethical question. It should be. And that's why humanistic study is so important. Important as a road to a land ethic. I'm going to talk more about this later this afternoon as we wrap things up. But let me uh, detail for a moment the limitation of a scientific, strictly scientific and technological approach to these questions we're dealing with today. We can approach the environment, broadly speaking, at the level of understanding. That is, we can try to understand what makes it work as a system. We can turn to the botanist, the zoologist, the ichthyologist, the ecologist. We can take it apart down to the molec molecular components and put it back together again. And we can gain an understanding, yea, to the very percentage of carp in the uh, upper Skunk River. Uh, that's a kind of an in-joke uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> refers to a very, actually a very fine article in the Iowa Journal of Research, that uh, the current issue. But my point is that this understanding is not alone sufficient to produce what I call love, and I think we humanists understand what I mean by that term, and moving on from love to protection of something like an environment. To bring it back to a more meaningful way, I don't think that understanding a person is sufficient to develop an attitude of love and then a protection toward that person. That is, if you know the percent of water that composes a woman's body, and you know how much phosphorus and calcium are in her bones, you've measured her, you know how her organs work, you have a whole textbook about her. To me, this is a prelude, perhaps, but certainly not a sufficient condition for loving that woman, and beyond that, protecting her. And so, I would urge that in thinking about the environment, we use some of this same analogy. To understand how it works is important, sure, but without love, we're not going to reach that top of the pyramid protection or responsibility. The humanities, if you want a short definition, are the discipline of love. And I think that's what the world, the earth, needs now. Love, sweet love. Uh, you have to take it out of the economic, the scientific, and technological sphere. And recognize that valuable as these things are, they can only take us so far and no further in our relationship with the environment, with the land. To go further, we need the humanistic approach. Turning a little more specifically to some of the themes that are going to be raised today in some of the papers and discussion, let me just talk about two. The first is the question of the definition of what is rural. I want to suggest my viewpoint at the outset, namely that the definition of what is rural really is a very subjective concern. I would suggest to you that there is no one thing that is rural, that you can define ruralism or rurality and say that is rural. Everybody would say right on because I think it would vary from person to person quite widely. I think that to ascribe a rural condition to environment is much like ascribing a condition of beauty to a piece of music or art. It's going to vary with people. Some will find it very repulsive. Ultimately then, a rural condition is a state of mind. The real country is in the mind, not out there under the corn. It's what people think about the land. And we might expect this, and I think the papers support the idea that this definition varies from culture to culture. It varies from epoch to epoch. And the symbolic significance attached will also vary because of the subjectivity 
this lack of a precise definition of rural. So every time that term is used today, I think we ought to be asking in the back of our minds, what is the person who's using that term really mean by the rural condition? And perhaps if this symposium does nothing else than define what is the rural at the end of the day in some way, or, or explore the various definitions, we have accomplished a great deal. And this means that I think we need to resist the tendency to see the urban-rural-wilderness dichotomy, or trichotomy, as too cut and dried. I think it's too cut and dried, and we have to resist categorizing experiences, literature, art, into either city art, rural, or wilderness. I'd rather substitute the concept of a spectrum of conditions that permit us, for example, to see the rural as well as the urban elements in something like suburbs, and to see the urban as well as the rural elements in something like a farm. You see, these are not clear-cut categories. They're elements of all these conditions, I think, in almost every landscape, every human condition. And the second and final theme I want to touch on that I think is going to be with us today is why does man attach significance to the rural condition? Again, I need, I think, to warn us all against being monolithic in addressing this question. We shouldn't expect there to be one answer. We ought to expect variety. And in addressing it myself, from my own subjective niche, the reason I think significance is attached to the rural has really been discussed quite well by Sigmund Freud in a book called Civilization and Its Discontents. Freud was really analyzing a philosophical position known as primitivism. Primitivism is widely misunderstood and sometimes thought to only mean a return to the wild, to caves, uh, following Jack London's buck through the Klondike frozen north. But really, primitivism to me just means a, a turn away from civilization. It possibly could all lead all the way back to the Klondike, but possibly could also lead to a farm in Keokuk. It's just retreating from a state of civilization, saying that man is happier, better, more beautiful, in a less civilized condition. Now, to me, this is always the product of highly civilized societies that you almost have to become over-civilized before you can begin or get into this post-civilized condition before you can begin to see the liabilities, identify, as Freud put it, the discontents of civilization. And we should also note that in this celebration of the rural that we often get in post-civilized societies, we are frequently celebrating not an, an actuality, but a, an ideal. I think all of us recognize this very clearly, but it's something we ought to keep in mind today. We're talking about people who wouldn't know the difference between a cow and a corn plant, who are celebrating them in the nth degree. So a lot of this rural enthusiasm or primitivism is what I sometimes like to call intellectual masturbation. It's a kind of an exercise that is gone through by of people who have no intention of getting out with a harrow or with a down sleeping bag. Well, I think today we'll illuminate these and, and other issues. And I'd like to now uh, turn for some other opening remarks to Professor George Thompson, forestry here at ISU. George. Thank you. Uh, this is really a misnomer to call mine opening remarks. Uh, my remarks are the result of uh, trying to hire a camp for, or a cook for forestry summer camp at the time the manuscript was due, uh, arranging for minibuses from the carpool and uh, some of the other odds and ends of uh, my academic life that uh, I really sort of hoped I'd get a paper written in time for it to... Uh, be reviewed by our host here. So actually, what uh, I am going to say here and what I fancy to be the next 18 minutes and 30 seconds, except for bursts of applause and one thing or another, will be an attempt to show me and my profession and my background to you and uh, to see where we come together. <clears throat> 
I've titled it, not opening remarks at all, but uh, the, Prairie Gro the Prairie Grove Revisited. Uh, I also subtitled it, uh, The View from Rob Thompson's Woods. Uh, both of these titles happen to be stolen. Uh, Donald Culross Petey many years ago wrote about the Prairie Grove. Uh, it impressed me a great deal in my earlier days. Uh, Ernie Gould and uh, Hugh Raup of the Harvard Forest wrote a very interesting article called The View from John Saunderson's Woods, talking about the tracings of activities in uh, New England. But at any rate, uh, let me proceed. Considering my origins as a farm boy, preceded by four generations of ancestors who had lived on the same land, and my professional career as a forester and teacher, it's not surprising that I see the theme of this symposium as a vehicle to support my own ponderings of that heritage of the underprivileged, the farm woodlot, commonly called the Prairie Grove. I've been long intrigued by the transition of the Midwestern woods from a position first of utility, then of nuisance, and finally a present aesthetic worth that stimulates environmentalists to set aside these lands as green belts and prompts developers to subdivide them. But once embarked on the task of putting my thoughts together, I faced several difficulties. Number one, Hamlin Garland, describing his boyhood on the middle border in 1874, 60 years before my own equivalent stage of boyhood, saw his youth and the land not much differently than I, and he wrote it down much better than I, and looking back at it, it wasn't as pessimistic as I had remembered it was. At least that part of his youth he seemed thoroughly to have enjoyed on the middle border. Second, I suffer from the one-case induction method in framing my thoughts, and the generalizing from my own vivid personal experiences lacks scholarly technique, and here I am among scholars in this field. And third, scanning the program, I find myself singularly alone in this gathering of humanists, or lovers, as the case may be. If I am to play the role of the token rustic, we are all in a great deal of trouble. <laughs> because among farmers, I'm considered a schoolteacher. But among educators, I'm considered a lumberjack. <laughs> and among lumberjacks, I'm considered a forester, which is quite a different thing. And among foresters, I'm sometimes considered a philosopher, because I read things occasionally get into groups like this. But among philosophers, I shall be exposed as the hornbook epigram quarter that I am. I am properly ill at ease. Lily, I discovered, wrote, so the traveler that straggleth from his own country is in a short time transformed, transformed into so monstrous a shape that he is fain to alter his mansion with his manners and to live where he can, not where he would. And in the same process, I discovered Washington Irving spotted another worry of all of us who would portray a time or a place. I fear I shall give equal disappointment with an unlucky landscape painter who had traveled on the continent, but following the bent of his vagrant inclination had sketched in nooks and corners and by places. His sketchbook was accordingly crowded with cottages and landscapes and obscure ruins, but he would neglected to paint St. Peter's or the Colosseum, the Cascade of Terni, or the Bay of Naples and had not a single glacier or volcano in his whole collection. And I think this is what you may see in my paper here. Assume for starters that we who pursue tillage, from which the other arts follow, are not completely insensitive to our surroundings. Observe, for example, that look of absolute contentment on the face of even a farm dog when he sits on his front porch after breakfast looking over his domain. Recognize that income is derived from the productivity of the land, as far as farm people are concerned. And recognize further that the quality of one's life as a land manager or farmer is a function of several things. The intelligence and daring of the operator, the level of technology available, the capital and labor resources at hand, the physical health of the on-site entrepreneur, the random distribution of the weather, the owner's internal aspiration for the attainable things, and finally, a spiritual awareness and appreciation of the physical world around him. Since I am no longer directly of the land, I have to look back to my youth and try to see myself and my father, who I realize that I now view as a slightly mystic figure of a philosopher deprived of an education, 
or an explorer confined first in his life to narrow geographic limits imposed by the number of railroads a young boomer telegraph operator could operate on. This is the way most northern Illinois farm boys got away from home as they learned the key and uh, worked the railroads. My father had seven brothers, and that's how they all got away from home. And later on, by the constraints imposed by just how far away one could get from home when cows had to be milked twice a day, and where weekends differed from weekdays only in that one could go to town Saturday night and, as Mark Twain said first, watch haircuts. My youth as a third and last son can be defined as hardworking but sheltered. Those weren't my banks that went broke in 1930. It wasn't my herd of dairy cows that was wiped out by Bangs disease inspectors. It wasn't really all that serious to me to observe that our net come income one year was a negative $600. It didn't really strike me that Franklin Roosevelt was destroying the self-sufficiency of farm people. I wasn't the one who had to build the straw stack in front of the blast of a thrashing machine where one breathed the concentrations of ragwood pollen, the smut of molding oats left too long in the field due to August rains. I didn't have to cough black for the next two days. And the pre-hybrid tall corn that had to be lifted out of frozen down shocks by a man that never weighed more than 160 pounds was not mine to lift. Yet here was a man that maintained a mowed lawn a full acre in size back before that was very common. Raised over 50 kinds of tea roses and wouldn't sell living trees from our woodlot and subscribed to magazines other than the, new than the Farm Journal and Wallace's Farmer. Saturday Evening Post may not have been the New Republic. And Alexander Botts and the Earthworm Tractor Company may not have been War and Peace, but it was a cut above the norm for northern Illinois where I grew up. If some awareness of the ascetic segment and the humanistic values was so deeply rooted in my farmer father that the debilitations of an ulcer, hemorrhoids, that plague of the working man on farms, and ultimate death by emphysema from 84 years of dust, couldn't grub out, then it's fair to say that agriculture and aesthetics can coexist in the most ordinary of people. Now, I find it challenging but difficult to collate my romanticized notion of my ancestors they settled on farms in Illinois with my current ideas of agriculture and the humanities. Did my ancestors really feel a spiritual kinship with the land, or do I just transfer my latter day and cultivated awarenesses back to a time when it was felt that agriculture was the talking about, but farming was the doing? More disconcerting still is this question. Would I, or you, with the newfound prosperity and lives of considerable ease, be as tenderly concerned as we are now for the environment if we suffered from malaria, milk sick, mastoid infections while hand milking 20 cows a day? When tillage begins, the other arts follow, but generally some distance back out of the dust. Among those of us with middle class security, there's spread a cult that reveres primitive things, and here I take on our moderator, and I'm a little reluctant to do so. And I don't really think I do, in fact, but it may sound so at the start. And despite a fair amount of artistic sophistication, there seems to be a scenic naivety that leads us to demand ever more vast panoramas of space set aside for our wonderment. In short, we yearn for a wilderness experience that our predecessors dreaded. A night flight over Iowa on a small plane gives the impression that the whole prairie is a city with porch lights burning. For even 5,000 feet, the yard lights at quarter-mile intervals seem to illuminate the entire land. But I can easily remember the pre-REA days when one went to bed when the Delco batteries ran down. You'd go downstairs and the balls would be down. You know the lights are about to go out, you'd go to bed. That was the process. And I can see how devastatingly dark my upstairs bedroom was. And here again how the windmill so eerily moaned on dark nights when the wind shifted. I shudder yet at the primal fear engendered by the dark and the uncanny effect of stair treads returning to position on a cold night in the exact sequence in which they were depressed as I went upstairs to bed. The effect of a huge and slow-moving night walker that climbed the stairs and stood breathlessly outside my door was overwhelming. I tried to read Bram Stoker 15 times before I was 25, and Dracula just scared me so bad I never did get it read until I was a grown man and then in the afternoon. Absolutely without external conditioning of any kind, I was aware of primitive horror and knew then how great must have been the compulsion of early settlers to clear the dark and crowding forest from around their dooryards. 
They said it was to clear hay land for the horse that they had to have in order to clear cropland. Or they said it was to clear a field of fire to keep away marauders. But reread Conrad Richter and the little girl. All she knew was the ever forest where the roads were dim paths coaxing you to come on while the monster brown butt stood around still as death waiting for you to get lost. All her life she lived in the woods, yet still she wasn't of the woods, and still the woods were against her. Oh, it had evil things in the woods that were older than the oldest man. The woods shut you in and fought you while you lived and sucked up your flesh and blood with its roots after you died. And it continues. Not that she listened long. Everybody was talking to some other buddy. When they got through, they'd talk to somebody else. And when they had no more talk, they just stayed and listened to others talk, for it'd be a long time till they had meeting again, and all were loath to leave each other for the lonesome woods. Yet the forests of the Midwest were much sought after. And when my New Hampshire great-grandfather brought his wife and her parents to northern Illinois, they settled immediately on the roughest, woodiest, New England-ish farm that they could find on the southern edge of the 12-mile grove in which I grew up. There wasn't a day that I didn't feel gratitude to my ancestors for picking such a boy-awarding site. And my dad never forgave them for picking such a hard-to-farm farm. The latter-day emigre had nothing left for them but rich, deep prairie soils. And they prospered mightily and begat rich sons and grandsons whose children have populated the earth while the Thompsons have withered and retreated to become chemists and bankers and school teachers. But after all, the prairie groves sheltered one from the wind and provided fuel. And if the site were good enough, and thus the trees tall enough, one's log cabin could be longer and wider than one's neighbor. It's a straight function of how high the trees grew. The popple clumps, called towheads, grew in the wet pastures and the edges of woods, and its members were long and slim enough to provide rafters for the barns. And these, along with the walnut sills, can still be found in those hundred-year-old barns near forest woods, farm woods. And the groves had a sound to them and a shady look to them that was more homelike than the sameness of the big blue stem prairies. To one unaccustomed to it, wrote Washington Irving in a buffalo hunt, there is something inexpressibly lonely in the solitude of a prairie. The loneliness of a forest seems nothing to it. There the view is shut in by trees, and the imagination is left free to picture some livelier scene beyond. But here we have an immense extent of landscape without a sign of human existence, and we have the consciousness of being far, far beyond the bounds of human habitation. We feel as if moving in the midst of a desert world. Well, that's an Easterner talking about the Midwest, and that's quite different from the big sky of Guthrie, and you get right down to it. Except in the Germanic communities, there was no real attempt to save the forest for aesthetic purposes, either for the citizens of a century ago or for us who choose to recreate in woodlands. The woods followed the streams and intermittent drainages and seldom ventured from the slopes up onto the level land where the periodic prairie fires perpetuated the grassland and withered the invading forest. Thus there was little desire to clear forest for cultivation when the prairie, while obdurate and at first uh, brutal to plow, could be cultivated with so much more success. Yet the forest was cleared, partly for heating. A big farmhouse by 1880 or 1890, like the one I was still living in later, could gobble up 12 tons of coal, or half its uh, BTUs, uh, uh, isn't really, as far as wood is concerned, 24 tons of wood. In the four north to south 40s that made up the average farm from the homesteading days, one would seldom expect to find more than 20 or 30 acres of woodland. And 12 cords of wood would just about be the annual increment from such a woodlot. So the forest was continually losing its older and bigger trees to the furnace and cook stove, and replacing them with their progeny of at least those trees, that could, or at least with those trees that could invade the shade of their elders. So the forest was always there, but always changing. Not because of forestry, which hadn't come to America yet, and not because of a desire to perpetuate it, but simply because for a while demand and supply were in balance. But the balance didn't last long because the railroads were already the Mississippi by the Civil War and were ready to create the cattle towns across Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas. And the oak forest fell by the thousands of acres to provide ties and fuel. Nowadays, a 12-inch oak tree is about 100 years old in Iowa. And it is seldom that one could get more than two ties per tree. And with 200 trees per acre, or 400 ties per acre, that takes between 35 and 55 acres of woodland to build a mile of railroad track. 
But the clearing to bare soil a hundred years ago gave us back the oak forests that were, are now once again old, and just in time for us with our newfound aesthetic sense and leisure to enjoy them and worry over them as they teeter once again on the brink of their second growth senility. And this is what we see every time the big winds come through now. It's odd that the diaries of the early settlers didn't comment on this passing of the forest, for the evidence of the tree rings is there to see. But no one ever sees a tree grow, and perhaps the activities of tie hacks and woodcutters were so commonplace from the beginning and so widely distributed, and perhaps provided for so welcome an opportunity for field and pasture expansion that it simply wasn't worth commenting on. I've suspected in an aside for a long time that I am a domesticated version of my ancestors. I don't suppose that I really want wilderness on a 24-hour basis, dawn to about 3.30 maybe, but then lead me back to my stable, for I am a daytime druid. I'll leave it to other stags at eve to drink their fill, fill on lone Ben Arden's lofty hill. I am convinced that the call of the West would have been too weak for many of us, probably for me. Most people seem to prefer wilderness as sort of a non-denominational non cathedral or a place to carry on an acceptable pursuit of hairy chestedness until one's granola runs out. <laughs> True wilderness can be visited, but it's no place to stay. It simply can't be tolerated for long until it is housebroken, gelded, and the wildness driven out. But the prairie grove has attached itself to my memories as the focal point of my own early contemplations, and those contemplations led to wonderment and fulfillment and I was surprised to find it echoed in my one-room country school by earlier men. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er hill and dale. The cattle are grazing, their heads never raising, their forty feeding like one. Now these are all the naturalist poets that thought this way, and I was surprised that I thought that way so many years later. And it was the woods that made me think that way. And this feeling must have been experienced by all farm people to some degree. My woods had been the location of old settlers' picnics from the beginning. One simply didn't picnic on the prairie if there were any alternatives. To go to the woods was adventure, surcease from labor, not only for squirrel hunters and mushroom hunters from Rockford, but for the 20-year-old girl country school teachers who could take all eight grades of us, 20 of us, that would be, and go on bird and bee hunts as this one-half-day-a-year unit on nature appreciation was commonly called. Only getting off at 2 p.m. Friday to rake the schoolyard leaves could match bird and bee hunts as an occasion of rejoicing for country schoolboys and girls. In the Great Depression, the county bought part of my prairie grove as a forest preserve to serve as a pleasuring ground, as New Yorkers had set aside the Adirondack Preserve a half-century earlier. Picnicking was the main venture, and commanded crowds during the 30s and 40s that haven't been matched since. We country people were astonished at the vast number of toilets that were built. A swimming beach was made out of a bend in the creek, and that little sluggish, cow-polluted, leech-infested pond swarmed with people for a few years until the forces of sedimentation reclaimed the channel and giant ragweed reclaimed the shore as the popularity of the park declined because people began to travel more widely and the Dolomite Bluffs were dwarfed by the Wisconsin Dells and by the Black Hills and by the Tetons and by the Alps as each in turn became more accessible. The hand-operated pump, the outdoor toilets, the absence of golf courses, the lack of trails through the no longer grazed underbrush, and surely the competition from new and better managed parks brought about an end to the popularity of that park right at the threshold of the environmental era. I returned to that forest reserve last spring, and I was all alone, except for a boy and a girl and a guitar. It wasn't my guitar, nor my boy nor girl. They were the only ones using it. My woods was just about like it was 35 years before, except for one thing. The fence was gone between the park and what had been our woods, and picnic tables were located right up the back door of the old farmhouse that I was born in. The pressure to acquire recreation sites and the growing reluctance of the owner to keep up the woods had conspired finally to do away with the old Thompson place, this time not at a dollar and a quarter an acre, but $800 an acre. My New Hampshire grandfather's land judgment was apparently a good deal better than mine. I hope the picnicking, frolicking public appreciates that one black maple tree where Maud and Bess could always be caught stomping flies in the shade when it was time to get them up for corn plowing. I hope somebody points out the shallow ditch as being the old stage road 
I even wish somebody could visualize the fox in that glacial rock along Hilton's fence by evening light and appreciate how it scared me as a five-year-old boy bringing up the cow. Those parks and woodlands and set-aside lands can do us all a lot of good. And in these worst days when the mobs are bad, it pays to remember how worthwhile they are. For a woodland needs to be worthy of its heritage by reminding people where they came from. And maybe, like the primitiveness, like the primitives of Grandma Moses, make us nostalgic for times we never knew. Isn't there a sense of wonder that we need to catch more often than we do? So I look with great interest at this day on how others in the room equate the remorseless practicality of tillage with that wider view that states, all nature is but art unknown to thee. Thank you. Thank you, that was uh, delightful. I wondered if we might take uh, just five minutes here um, to uh, see if any of you have any comments you'd like to throw out to Professor Thompson about this. We do have another paper coming up, but uh, there might be possibly a comment or two, a quibble or caveat. One that I might enter just uh, to start it off, George, is, is to observe uh, that I don't think we really are that far apart in our view of wilderness and, and the people who go to it. You recall my thesis is uh, almost constantly that is the, the over-civilized, post-civilized person who returns to the wilderness with his granola, as you say, and uh, who only takes it in doses, short doses, um, the constant life. I've seen a lot of people's love of wilderness killed off by becoming a guide and having to work three months at a fishing lodge or running a river in the west. And after about six weeks, they yearn for a book. And so it's really the alternation that uh, is everything here. like to uh, welcome some of you people who came in and ask you, if you haven't, to just register in that little book that's on the table right out there. You can do it during a coffee break or whenever, but there's a book for uh, you to put your name down. Well, let's move on, uh, keeping to schedule with uh, Professor Paul Hollenbach. Uh, relationship to the environment, to those relationships provided us by the scientists and the technologists. The reason that I think has become abundantly clear today is that science and technology alone do not begin to penetrate to the roots of our relationship with the rural environment or with any environment. These roots lie in our attitudes, they lie in our feelings, and they lie in our values. They lie in our ethical and aesthetic senses. And they're as much a part of our imaginations as they are our physical senses. Indeed, the uh, sustenance and preservation of a rural option in this increasingly urban nation depends, I think, more on humanistic factors in the long run than it does on the agricultural sciences. And so I commend this great scientific and technological institution for encouraging the humanists to have their day and to express their ideas in the Iowa Journal of Research. More particularly, the papers raise issues 
as every good session does that tend to complicate things rather than make them more simple i was go away from these things feeling i know a lot less than i did when i came in things i thought i'd worked out my mind now seem quite complex i think that's a sign of a good symposium and so it is today with rural life first of all on the question of what is rural life we talked about the real life out there under the sun we talked about various idealized notions of the rural life as propounded by people in very unrural situations we've also asked the question of what is the effect of the real upon the ideal and on the, the ideal upon the real and we tried to understand in several of these papers which is the more important in determining conduct and influencing the course of history it's no surprise to humanists i think that the artistic conception is at least as important as a reality we are as a race a gullible people we cling to the vision of rural bliss, for instance, long after the grounds for believing it have gone. And the bones of many farms and farmers testified to that truth. Our view of the West is as much a product of Zane Gray and Bonanza as it is experience. And for those who lack the experience at all, the imaginative depiction is the only source of information they have about, say, the West. Another complication we've come into that springs from the problem of definition is the use of the rural life as a technique of social criticism. We've seen that men from the 8th century BC on through Greek and Roman theater to the Renaissance, to the early modern period and 20th century Russian and American writers, right up to the long hair, countercultural, whole earth catalog, dogs as a way of life school of thinking, have used rural forms as means of social criticism. We can, I think, generalize that the rural option uh, represents an alternative to the urban. And whether it's a legitimate alternative or not, that is, whether it's realistically de depicted or not, it can be used effectively to challenge certain things about urban ways of life. I think coming to some of these particular significances is something we've done today, too. We recognize that rural life brings men closer to the source the ultimate source of dependency for survival, namely on the land itself. And it brings them closer to a recognition of this dependency. It brings them closer, does the rural life, to a sense of their vulnerability. And it exposes them to beauty, we've seen, in certain ways that have touched men's hearts and souls and minds. And the rural life does tend to breed an innate, if not an articulated, land ethic, what you might call a ecology of the spirit rather than one of the laboratory. And the rural life can also lead to restraint, the simple knowledge that the world is finite because one's field is finite is a very simple but a very important lesson that city people often don't know because the supermarket never seems to be finite. There's always more in the stockroom, they think. And finally, the rural life can lead to a relationship with the environment that is one of long-term stability rather than short-term ripoff. This at least is more true for the peasant than for the American pioneer, but in this day and age, pioneering has been pushed to the far corners of Alaska, and the American rural person is increasingly adopting some of the longer-term ways of thinking of older world peasant mentalities. This is to the good. In conclusion, I think that rural life, and I distinguish when I say that from agribusiness, is a valuable component of the American experience. Along with wilderness and civilization, having rural life helps us preserve diversity and a chance for men to alternate back and forth, to experience a variety of environmental conditions, to have their two weeks here and their two weeks there, or their half year here and their half year there that Thoreau at least defined as an optimum condition for man, the alternation, taking the best of both worlds. And so I want to commend the symposium committee, wish them every success in promoting interdisciplinary teaching and research at Iowa State. Okay, you can kind of scratch the tape now if you prefer to just cut it off at that point because now we're going to go into a little song and dance routine, move this thing, and show a few slides. Sorry that was so formal, but they wanted to put it on me. Yeah. Someone would just pop that projector on and... Uh
turn off the lights. I just wanted to touch on a couple of things. You'll have to change. Sure, of some of these alternatives that we've been talking about today. And we've had, had occasion to look at the spectrum of environmental types and the various associations that humans have had with them and the various feelings they engender in people. And I take this to be the wilderness. Uh, it is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, Tennessee, North Carolina, mostly virgin stuff, although the lower reaches may have once been cornfields and came back in tulip poplar. I don't know, George, if you can spot that, but pretty much up in the higher country, it's virgin stuff. But here is the fresh green breast of the New World in Fitzgerald's terms, the uh, ridges uh, receding one beyond the other that uh, created such a colossal vitality of illusion in this country, the illusion that uh, we would never run out, that this was an inexhaustible cornucopia of resources, the kind of frontier hangover it's taking us so long to get over. Hit the next slide, please. And then we go to various patterns that men have written upon the land. Stegner's pathing the land. Here's a, you could focus that with a little button on the front, please. Just, uh, there you go. This is England, rural England, the uh, archetype, uh, neat hedgerows and uh, fields, which uh, bespeak for many the archetypical rural condition, and has figured in a lot of our discussion today. Moving further on the spectrum toward the civilized, next please, we might look at the highly stylized gardens. These happen to be the Longwood Gardens in Delaware, but we could substitute the gardens of Versailles or what have you, where nature is trimmed and pruned to man's will, where he's in total control over the situation. It's interesting that in some of these formal gardens, they even left a corner in a maze carefully contrived that was called a wilderness, where people could wander around. That was a formal part of a formal garden, right? Next slide brings us to the other end of the spectrum. There's downtown Keokuk, and uh, if you can focus that a bit, you can get a sense of uh, how far we've come from the Great Smoky Mountains. Now, I think that the idea behind everybody's thinking today and implicit in everybody's mind right now is that people who live in that rectangular grid pattern have much different attitudes toward the environment than those who live in the spectrum range that we've seen previously here. They can't help but uh, be divorced from the natural world and in so doing uh, pay the price in uh, certain blindnesses uh, regarding man's proper relationship to it. You could put the next one on, please. I wanted just to identify myself on this spectrum. This is the view from my bedroom window when I, where I grew up in New York City for 18 years. Uh, six feet away across the alley was that factory. I'm standing. This is the view I saw every morning when I got up. Stretched, went to the window. There it was. Once in a while, a, legend, a little pigeon crap on the wall. But that was the only sign of life. I couldn't see a single living thing. Look right, look down, look up. Nothing lived, nothing moved. Once while I was eating my bran flakes at the table, there was a blur by the window. I thought finally a pigeon or something had flown down. I went to look, but someone had jumped from the 32nd floor and were now spread out over about 50 yards of sidewalk below. Uh, that's called growing up in New York. And uh, one thing that growing up in New York does, uh, I think it does two things. It either makes you, uh, so you never want to leave New York and think west of the Hudson is uh, Indian territory, or it uh, makes you into a raving wilderness fanatic. Uh, Robert Marshall, uh, Dave Brower, many people came out of very urban situations. Uh, scratch a Sierra Clubber, you'll often find uh, a very urban type of person, and that's something this symposium has confirmed again and again. So uh, maybe it was one way that, that having had this experience as a boy, I uh, decided to spend the next 17 years of my life as much as I could in wild places, the alternation that Thoreau was talking about. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to just touch on a couple of the attitudes that the um, urban experience engenders, uh, to some extent, the rural experience, too. Here's a guy in Pasadena down in Southern California. That's a real estate agent. And uh, I think the sign over his office is kind of revealing. For many of us, uh, and for many cultures, going back into the human past, this is an incredible picture. I mean, how can this son of a gun 
purport to sell the earth. Um, how can he get up in the morning and say, well, I'm going out to sell the earth today, honey, or come back and say, I sold it? I mean, from whom does he get the right? God, the chipmunk, Smokey the Bear, George Thompson? I don't know where he gets the right from to sell the earth. I don't know where anybody gets the right to own the earth. The American Indian never had it, surely, and many other cultures have had the use value of the land without the ownership value of it. Ownership as in human slavery, which gave you an ultimate uh, absolute right over what became a chattel. So this is one of the problems. And uh, although we've had land ownership in many rural societies, because agriculture has denoted a certain degree of sedentariness, as opposed to, say, hunting and gathering communities, which didn't need land ownership, um, still, uh, to own is not to necessarily abuse. But frequently, ownership is an institution that promotes abuse um, because it gives uh, the individual absolute rights. Now checked somewhat, as has been pointed out just a moment ago, by zoning laws and certain restrictions that are just beginning, wouldn't you agree, to be placed on individual landowners, but just beginning. Land, like people's bedrooms, I'm talking about population policy, is still a very sacred place. Uh, next uh, slide, please. How about that as a definition of land? Would the Navajo have agreed? Would the Wallapai, the Hopi? Would Black Hawk have agreed? I don't think so. Keokuk? Grand Canyon subdivision does, though. Next slide. Well, here's the kind of village that blew my mind when I was in Yugoslavia. I found Yugoslavia like five centuries older than Germany as I skied my way down through the Alps and into Yugoslavia. And I found uh, villages like this tucked back in the Julian Alps of Yugoslavia that had been there for a thousand years. The typical pattern we've reviewed today of the cluster for protection, the outlying fields and woodlots, and the frame of mind that this engendered, uh, the sense uh, that George gave us as he started off this uh, meeting so eloquently of um, having a woodlot that had to support you this year and the next year. And that if you ran out, you couldn't simply go over the ridge because that was somebody else's woodlot and the sense of hanging in there for the long term that the American was, I think, tragically released from for a moment. Next slide, please. The kind of... <laughs> the kind of institutional behavior that that environmental situation engenders might be symbolized by this woodshed. I've never seen a woodshed like this in uh, Iowa. Uh, or anywhere else for that matter, uh, where people uh, pile wood as a work of art. Don't just toss logs around and the little pieces are just kicked away or burned up in the spring, but where every faggot the size of a pencil is, uh, is carefully stacked. This is an attitude that comes from knowing, knowing the limits of the earth. That's a Yugoslavian woodshed in a forest that I've been told was producing, had production records for 700 years. Next, please. And finally, this picture that I mentioned earlier this morning, that, of course, is Mount Rushmore, one way of leaving your mark upon the land. And down below uh, is an Oglala Sioux by the name of Ben Black Elk. He's the son of Black Elk of Black Elk Speaks fame, a book some of you may be familiar with. And uh, it's just different styles of relating to the environment, uh, the Indian going through it as a hunting and gathering people without leaving a trace of his passing upon the land. Uh, the agriculturist, of course, uh, even Stegner, uh, making his path, leaving his mark, making the rough places plain. And then uh, the American uh, dream up there, carving your presidents uh, 60 feet high uh, on a hill. I've always thought the dogs had a much better way of demarking territory. They simply raised their leg. It's more organic anyway. <laughs> but uh, we have to do strange things like this. Next slide, please. Well, here's a little diagram that I'm just going to end up with that uh, I think is promoted by the rural way of life, at least uh, facilitated by it. I spend uh, a whole seminar discussing environmental ethics uh, at the University of California. But you remember we talked about, how do you pronounce the name, Robert, the man who loved the birds? Theco? What? They know, right. He never left his county, and he was regarded as a kook by his contemporaries because he uh, he kind of liked the birds. He allowed them to nest in his house and pick uh, over his fields. And I think that what Thénault had done is expand up that diagram beyond the self, family, and tribe and on up through um, into the mammals category, possibly beyond that. I'm suggesting here that ethics have a way of growing.
This, of course, a very Aldo Leopoldan doctrine in concept. He suggested the same thing, the way we have evolved ethically and the potential for continuing ethical evolution is what that time frame on the left is designed to suggest. But right now, most of us have a cutoff where you see the present about in the mammals or animals category. We've seen time and again today that most rural people will cherish and defend useful animals. Uh, other people will defend cute animals. Nice brown-eyed cows, gentle deer, Bambi's mother, chipmunk, Smokey the Bear. These things are within the ethical pale. We'd be disturbed if we see someone killing a dog outside the hall here. We call maybe a society for the prevention of cruelty to animals. But if we walk a little further and see a farmer pouring what we call pesticides, which are really biocides, on a field, we'd probably say, good, there'll be more yield here. So that's our cutoff. And uh, there have been thinkers, though, and maybe Thénault was a, uh, a precursor of them, who called upon us to have reverence for life. Doesn't mean you stop eating and killing things to eat. Of course not. Food chains remain the same, but wanton destruction doesn't. And if we lift up to life itself, and then beyond that, we see the potential of embracing the rights of rocks, the non-living environment, the air, the water, the soil. And if you really do believe in the rights of rocks, it becomes just as wrong to pollute the air as it does to rape your neighbor's husband. And that's uh, kind of a startling view to the Elks and Lions clubs of the world. But notice how they use animal names, too. So uh, maybe there's hope. And uh, this is one reason why uh, I think meetings like this are terribly important, because I do think uh, preserving the rural option is a way to understand the potential of ethical evolution, which I hardly have to say to you, I think is the bedrock answer to all the environmental problems. Thank you very much for your attendance today.